So good morning, everyone, again. As, as Rob said, my, my name is Kamalam Gubandile, and it's an absolute privilege to share God's word <clears throat> this morning. So we are looking at 2 Corinthians, so 1 Corinthians. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart is the man. So yeah, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 3. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to look at particular sections in those chapters. The, the, the book of Acts in chapter 18 tells the story of Paul's journey to the city of Corinth. And what, what Paul did is he grabbed two friends and they formed a church planting team. They, they went to Corinth and over a year and a half, they planted a local church in the city of Corinth. And after that, Paul then went to a different city called Ephesus. And while Paul is in Ephesus, stuff begins happening across in, in Corinth where he planted a church. There are difficulties and there are challenges. So, yeah, this was before airplanes and Zoom meetings and Facebook. So, so what Paul does to address this situation is he, he writes a few letters. And two of those letters that Paul wrote are part of the Bible, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> And this morning we're, we're looking at sections of chapter 2 and chapter 3. The, the trouble really that God, through Paul's letters, was addressing in Corinth was divisions in the local church. So there were divisions, there was conflict in the local church. I don't know if you have ever had an argument with someone in the local church or if you have ever had a disagreement with someone in the local church perhaps even hurt and disappointment. So, yeah, there's a possibility as well that not only have you received that, but perhaps you've been the one doing it. <laughs> perhaps you've been the one yeah, causing hurt, causing disappointment to the local church. So what would God say to us um, about this issue of disappointment, division in the local church? So this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 says. <clears throat> it says, and I, this is Paul writing, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. So in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul says, when I came to you, and he addresses them as, as brothers. So we, we know that this letter is addressing issues in the church. So he's, he's going to come with some conflict. He's going to come with some confrontation. But the first thing he does is he calls them brothers. And this is not just a word. When he calls them brothers, he, he affirms them. He affirms their salvation, that man, you're, you're, you're saved. We're going to address these things, but first, you're saved in Christ. He, he affirms their position in the local church. Yes, we're, we're, we're going to address that, but you are still part of the local church. And then thirdly, he, he also affirms his personal love for them. Man, I, I love you. That, that, that's what the word brother means. And he, he did the same thing in chapter 1, verse 2, where he says to them, the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So this, this approach that Paul took, it's like one of the elders, say, Rob Evans, standing up, there's an issue in the local church here at Grace Gen, and Rob stands up and says, guys, we need to address this, but first, before we address that, let me just say that your salvation is secure. And let me just say that your, your position as a member in this local church is secure. Let me say as well that my love for you is certain. So that's what Paul does. And isn't this a helpful recipe for all of us to use when we're challenging and confronting each other? There, I've noticed in my own life and some people as well that there are four natural responses I've, I've picked up on when it's time to confront or time to challenge. The one response is to avoid. Um, the other response is to attack. <laughs> the, the other response is to escape or to leave. And that the fourth response I've noticed in my own life now and other people as well is to gossip. So there's, there's a guy called Paul Tripp who, who wrote a book called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And, and Paul Tripp in his book addresses this issue of how, how do we navigate this as the local church? Because let's, let's, let's be honest, guys. Um, if, if you're married here, <clears throat> you've found someone 
that you delight in above many others, in fact, above all others in the world. This person that you delight in so much, even them you argue with. Isn't that bizarre? So we, we, we must expect that in the local church, there will be occasion for disagreement. There will be occasion <clears throat> for arguing as well. So Paul Tripp in his book addresses this. And what he puts forward as a model is what he calls love, no, speak, do. And effectively, he says, most of us, when we're confronting, either we'll avoid it or we'll just jump to the doing. You know, do this, do that, don't do that. And what he says instead, when it's time to confront in the local church or elsewhere, he says that the first thing we ought to do is to love. In your heart, nurture love for the individual. It must be nurtured because chances are it's not there at the moment. So nurture love for the individual. And then after you've nurtured that love for the individual, communicate the love to the individual. Of course, that looks different for different people. If it's your wife, you might say, I must tell you that I really, really love you. But if it's a colleague, you won't take the same approach. <laughs> so the, the heart of that is to communicate to the person that I am for you. I, I am with you, I am for you, even as we disagree. So nurture love and communicate love is the first thing. The second thing is to know. And when you're knowing, you're asking questions. Asking questions to understand, well, what really happened? What, what were your desires? And beneath your desires, what were you believing as, as that happened? I, I want to understand that. And that, that progression is quite important because, again, particularly in the local church, we, we understand that we live as we believe in the church. So if, if, if I believe that Jesus is my provider, I will live in a particular way. If, if I believe that we are one new man in Christ, I will live in a particular way from that belief. So oftentimes when you're doing the knowing part, you're, you're asking questions to understand, man, what, what does this person believe? I, I see their actions, and I'm going to ask about their desires, and then I'm going to ask about what they believe. What, what do you believe? And what often happens as, as you investigate that is you end up with what we might call a gospel disbelief, either in your own heart or in the other person. Chances are, as you navigate that, there'll, there'll be a particular thing that they believe, or perhaps you believe, that's slightly out of line with the truth. And what, used to, what usually happens there is repentance begins to creep in. Because, of course, you have horizontal repentance, or I'm sorry I offended you. But what's really valuable in a turnaround is not horizontal repentance, it's vertical repentance. When you're repenting horizontally, you're repenting usually for a particular action. I did that action, it offended you, I'm sorry. But as you ask those questions, you get to belief. What you realize, either as the person that must change or the other person is, there's something that God has said is true about himself that I haven't believed. God, I apologize. And there's a, there's a vertical response and a vertical turning around. So that begins to creep in as we, we know. And then after knowing, you, you can then speak. And I found it useful to look at speak in three sections. The, the one section being to speak the gospel. Um, what, what you've discovered as you were knowing is you've discovered a particular gap in, in their gospel or in your gospel. And what you want to do now is you want to speak truth, intentionally speak truth in that area. If, again, the issue, for example, is believing that you, we are one new man in Christ, then you can speak truth to that. and You can teach into that. You can do your research. What does the Bible say about that? So you speak truth, you speak the gospel. Then also you, you speak counsel. Um, again, our default when a problem comes up is we jump to the counsel. Let me tell you what to do. But usually after you've spent time loving and knowing, the counsel you eventually give is that much better. So it's still good to give counsel, but at that particular point, it's that much better. So you speak gospel, you speak counsel, and then you speak actions. There must be some kind of transformation. And you begin to offer suggestions. Perhaps you can do this differently or you can do that differently. 
And then finally, that takes us to the doing, where one actually lives in a different way. So that's the love, know, speak, do framework. And I've, I found this particularly helpful when we're discussing navigating differences or division in the local church. And really, as Paul navigates these issues in the church of Corinth, in some way he kind of does this as he first addresses them. Okay, we're going to address all these things, but first let me tell you that you are the church of God in Corinth. You are those sanctified in Christ. You are brothers and sisters. So likewise for us at Grace Gen as well, there is grace in our differences. God has grace for us, both for those that are offended and for those of us that are offensive. We remind ourselves as we navigate that, that we are one church, we are one man in Christ, we are sanctified together in Christ, and we are brothers, we are sisters. So we, we must address those things, but that's the platform that we move from as we address those things. And what that does as, as we get that is it actually gives us confidence. It, it gives us the confidence to not avoid things because I have a framework now. It gives us the confidence to not attack because, again, I have a legitimate means to solve the situation. It gives us confidence to not run away or leave prematurely. It gives us confidence to not gossip as well. Instead, we are equipped to love, to know, to speak, and to do. So, drawing from chapter 2 and 3, there are three things that I thought would be helpful for us to embrace this morning. The, the first one is embracing eternal life and eternal reward. The, the second one is embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. The third one is embracing the local church. So, let's look at the first one there. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 10 to 15, if you have your Bibles with you. This is what it says. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire." So again, Paul in this text is writing a letter to the church in Corinth and he's concerned about divisions in the local church and he's eager to, to preserve their unity. He, he, he delights in their unity. And you know, what about us? What, what about Grace Gen? I, I, I don't know all the church gossip. So we're, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15 and we've established that Paul is concerned about disunity and passionate about unity. And that God himself, looking at Grace Gen, our church, God likewise is, is concerned about any divisions there might be amongst us. And then also he, he delights in our unity, whatever that looks like. And reading verse 10 to 15, we, we can really say, for, for the sake of our unity, let us be a people that embrace eternal life that embrace eternal reward. So again, reading chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, we could say, let us as Grace Gen be a people that embrace eternal life, that embrace eternal reward. So you know, don't, don't be short-sighted and easily satisfied by this short life and its rewards. There's, there's much more that God has for you and for I. The reason this is important is because I think there's something that happens when our minds are convinced and our hearts are stirred about the reality of eternal life that, that causes us, I would say, to, to be less grasping. You know, it, it, it causes us to, to be slower to demand from each other, to be quicker to release to each other because we have a hope that stretches beyond our life. 
as, as you know, at some point, there, there was offense between man and God. We were considered enemies of God. And there was nothing that you and I could do about this. There, there was no sacrifice, no effort, um, no apology that could satisfy this. Yet, Jesus Christ comes into the picture, and through his incarnation, he became a man. His sinless life, his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ accomplished reconciliation between us and Christ and God. Now, that was not the only thing that Christ accomplished. The other thing that Christ accomplished was reconciliation, and that means restoring to friendship or good relationship or, or harmony. Christ also accomplished reconciliation between us and each other, between man and man. And this is very important because if, if you look around us, there, there is such evidence of God's reconciling work in this room. Um, some, some of us are financially abundant, some of us are financially in lack, but we're here together. Some of us are highly educated, some of us have not been able to progress that far in formal education, but we're here together. Some of us are white, some of us are black, some of us are Zulu, some of us are Shona, some of us are Afrikaans, but we're here together. And you might ask, what, what do these people have in common? What, what, what brings them here week after week? Why, why are they in each, each other's homes every week? What, what, what's, what's the reason for that? I mean, in the, in the AFCON, some of us are supporting Super Eagles, some are supporting Bafana. <laughs> and again, in the, in the elections, many of us will vote for different parties. But, but here we are together, worshiping God, and what's, what, what's the reason for that? And I, I would say part of it is, I, I think this idea of embracing eternal life and embracing eternal reward is already part of our DNA. It's, it's part of our view of life. That's why we, we live in this way. But further to that, this is it's, it's quite important. So let's look at the metaphor that Paul uses. I'm just going to grab a table. Sorry. Sorry, precious. So, again, in, um, can you pass me that tray, Sarah? Again, in, in, in chapter 10, thanks, thanks, man. Chapter 3, I mean verse 10 to 15, Paul, Paul paints a picture. And the, the, the picture that he paints, verse 10, he says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds. So there is a foundation in every believer's life, in every local church. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So we don't put our faith in the church or in the man of God. It's in Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Now, notice how he says someone else or, or each other person. Some people have believed that that refers only to teachers like Paul and Apollos. Some other people believe that refers to any believer. That's what I believe as well. So in this verse, effectively, Paul is saying to us that there's a foundation in the local church. There's a foundation in believer's life. And we have a role to play in, in building on that foundation. Let each person take care how they build on that foundation with whatever they have at their disposal. Now, this is what he says in verse 12 to 15. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he gets a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved only as through fire. So our, our picture here is, is of, of us as Christians. And um, it, Paul seems to say that the, the way we live our lives, 
and the way we make decisions, the way we act, it's, it's as though we, we could be building with, I, I didn't have gold, so I'm just using coins. It's, it's as though we, we could be building with, with, with gold or with silver. That's, that, that's the one option. Day to day, year after year, that's the one possibility. And then he says as well, the way we live our lives, the, the way we make decisions, the way we interact with the body of Christ, there's a possibility that one could be a Christian, but you could be building with wood, straw. Hey, this is just grass from my backyard. And then he says, what's, what's, what's going to happen? And then he says, what's, what's going to happen at some point is that the things you've done in life will be tested. There, there will be a testing of what you've done in life. And the, the idea here is that Paul is speaking to an audience where he assumes knowledge and acceptance of eternal life. So if, if I speak to Andre, for example, Andre, as a Christian, you and I, I'm like, I've, I've known you for a few years now, but really, I will know you for thousands of years. And at some point, our bodies will fail, but we will be resurrected to life again. And after that happens, you and I will never die again. And there's a particular point of transition from, from this life to eternal life. You know, as, as the song says, when, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began, there's life eternal in store for all of us who are saved here. This is a great thing that we must know and believe. Now he says, as a Christian, there's a particular transition point. That's what he's speaking to in verse 10 to 15, where you're, you're moving from this life to eternal life, and there's a testing of what you've done. If, if you're a Christian, God will not judge you. But I tell you, God will judge your works. That's what we see here. So you won't be judged, but your works will be judged. And what God says is, if you're wondering, have you lived a worthwhile life? If, if you're wondering, have, have you made good decisions in life? If, if you're wondering all the things that you've done, were they worth it or not? God is saying there's a particular point. We, we can all discuss and Skinner and make assumptions now, but there's a particular point where it will be objectively true with no debate. That's the point where all our works will be tested by fire. And the, the primary, in, in my reading of this text, the primary context of those works is each other. That blows my mind. That we're, we're, we're building on the foundation of Christ in the local church, in churches, and in each other's lives. And that, that work we've done will be tested. I apologize to the elders for making a fire in church. Um, it's for the gospel. <laughs> so, so what he says is that if you've built with, with gold, with silver, with precious stones... <laughs> so so yeah, that, that, that goes through the fire, but that remains. And then if, if you've built your life, your, your work with, with wood, with straw, there's going to be some smoke. So that, that imagine it's consumed. That, that's all consumed. And, and there's nothing left. The, the reason that matters is as, as offensive as this is, it's, it's a bit offensive to make a fire in church with smoke and all of that, but it's, it's nothing compared to the offense of lives standing before God on that day who are Christians and you see your life going up in smoke. They, the, this is a, a fairly high stakes conversation and God in his mercy and delight for us and our unity, <clears throat> he tells us way in advance that, guys, this, 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 this is important. And this is how you build unity. This is how you build each other up. <clears throat> and I, I believe what God would say to us through this text is that in order to live lives that ultimately matter, that ultimately have meaning, we must be a people 
that build each other up. We must be a people in the local church and relationships that build each other up. We must, in that sense, embrace eternal life and its rewards. So again, we would ask, how can I know? How, if, if you're navigating life now, you might ask, how can I know if I am doing work that's gold or if I'm doing work that's, that's straw? How, how do I tell the difference? And reading clues from the text, what, what I'd say is building each other up on Christ, with Christ, unto Christ. The, the idea there is that we're, as the local church, first building each other up on the foundation that is Jesus. Nothing else outside this really ultimately matters. There's much that flows out of this. There's, there's, there's work in the community. There's, there's work... With, uh, with children, there's work with orphans, there's work with the sick, but it all flows out of the foundation that is Jesus Christ. So we build each other up, but on the foundation that is Jesus Christ. And then secondly, we build each other up with Jesus Christ. Our, our, our main source of unction, ability, motivation, truth is Christ himself. Yes, there are other resources and there are other um, help manuals and self-help books, those are helpful. But the, the main thing that we have to offer to each other is Christ himself. This, this is the very thing that Peter and John did. Um, Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He held out his palm and he asked for an arm. This is what Peter did say to this lame man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What we have to offer to each other most is Jesus Christ. So we, we build first on Christ, we build first with Christ, and then really we build unto Christ. That's, uh, that's how we build with gold and not with straw and hell. That, that means that our, our goal as, as we serve each other, as we give in the local church, as we spend time, our goal is, is not our glory. Our, our goal is not the glory of the local church for, for us to be famous, but our, our glory is for Christ to be famous. Our aim is for Christ to be famous. So if we build upon Christ, with Christ and unto Christ, I believe that we'll be a people that build with gold and not with straw, with wood, or with hail. This is how we store up treasure for ourselves in heaven. Like, you are like a man who, who found a field, and in that field there was treasure. And he, he goes off and he, he sells everything he owns. The, I, I don't know if you've ever tried selling everything you own. It's not a quick process. This, the, the, this is, it takes time. This, this man, over time, with joy, was selling things he owned. And over time, because he had hope, hope in what he would receive and his future reward. And likewise, for, for, for the sake of our unity as a local church, I believe God is calling us to, to embrace eternal life, to embrace eternal reward. What, what tends to happen, I think, when we do that is, is one, we will be quick to release and we'll be slow to demand from each other when we've embraced hope in eternal life. And then also we will tend to build each other up as we serve, as we give, as we encourage, as we pray. Because again, we have a clear sense of man that reward is worth it. And then also, when we have embraced eternal life and eternal reward, we will tend to, it's not always, but we will tend to stick through in our relationships for the long run because we aren't looking for a quick solution and a quick buck. We, we, we have this eternal perspective in mind and that, that gives us the, the unction and the ability to, to continue even when it's difficult and even when there are differences. So we will continue having differences at Grace Gen. They will continue being offense and they will continue being misunderstandings. The truth in this text does not negate that. 
but what it does do is it gives us as a local church a measure of grace that as, as we encounter those circumstances, we, we have resource to navigate them in a way that glorifies God and that builds the local church. So that's the one thing, embrace eternal life and embrace eternal reward. <clears throat> then the second thing is to embrace the cross. Embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. So 1 Corinthians 2 verses 1 to 5 says this, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So here Paul is saying, guys, when, when, when I was around you, when, when I was in Corinth, my, my preaching was not based on my intellects, wasn't based on big words, it was based purely on Christ and nothing else. And there, there are three things that I'd, I'd like to draw our attention to. How, how, how do we embrace the cross in the context of discussing divisions of the church? So the, the one thing is to say that the cross is the sufficient glory of Jesus. So the cross is the sufficient glory of Jesus. When I was in primary school, boarding school, uh, we used to be let out of boarding school to go to town about once a week and we'd go shopping. And the one time they let us out, I found to my pure delight the largest lollipop I had ever seen it was a fist size. I was purely delighted. I bought it. I did not touch it until I got back to the hostel. When I got back there, I found a space by myself. I was not going to share it and I got involved with the lollipop. And as I took the first bite, I discovered this is in fact not a lollipop, it's an apple covered in candy. <laughs> so, so to this day, SK will tell you that I dislike apples <laughs> since then. And this idea of sugar coating, we can do the same thing with the gospel where we feel like, man, the, the gospel is too offensive or the gospel is too boring. The, the fact of Christ become man, living a sinless life, crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended, there's, there's no zing in that. Give me more. So it's perfectly fine to do fun things and to have cool lights and um, have great arguments, but our confidence must be in the unadorned gospel of Christ and the power of the cross. What, what tends to happen sometimes is if, if, if we win people over, not with the gospel, but with other stuff, they sometimes have the same reaction to the church and to the gospel that I did with the apple, where they realize, man, this is not what I thought it was. So the cross is the sufficient glory of Jesus. That's the one thing. The second thing is that the cross is a point of Christian humility. The point... The cross is a point of Christian humility. This helps us with, again, our unity. One of the issues, uh, we didn't get to it, but was pride. It was coming up in, in, this, in this local church. And <clears throat> some would say, I think I'm better than you because I'm, I'm with Paul. Or no, I'm with Apollos. The, the idea here, and we, we've used a, a framework over the last few months to discuss how we engage with our community. That framework has been the, the hero, villain, guide framework. The idea here is that we are not the hero in the story, but the people we want to reach are, are the main focus of our efforts. The, the, the villains are the things that are obstructing them from connecting with Jesus. And really, our role is to be the guide. So the, the fact that the cross is a point of humility. It, it reminds us that as, as we engage in the local church, our aim is not to have our names and lights um, to be praised um, or to be applauded. Our, our aim is to be a guide for what God is doing in the local church. Then the third point is that the cross is a point of Christian unity. And one could say that unity through the cross 
is realized not by negotiation, but by surrender. That is how you can have a diverse group of people loving God and loving each other because each person comes to the cross and surrenders. Really, we, we surrender all we have to the cross. And that is our point of unity, is, is the cross itself. So we embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. And then the last point, and uh, really I'm done, is that we embrace the local church. That is the, the you know, just a really practical outcome of this conversation, is that as we navigate the truth of how, how we do conflict, love, no speak, do, as we, as we embrace eternal life and eternal reward, and as we embrace the, the cross of Jesus Christ, where do we do that? And I would say, man, the, the local church is a great context for you to do that. And once you embrace the local church, whether you're, you're brand new, whether you're a non-Christian, whether you are actually a member for decades, there, 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 there's an opportunity that God has availed to all of us here to, to love each other, to serve, to be offended, and to work through offense. Uh, I believe God would call us to, to be a people that embrace the local church. Um, if, if not this one, then another one, but embrace a local church. Amen. Amen.